Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the uh, ECP webinar series. Uh, I'm Grant Harrington. I'll be uh, hosting with you today. Uh, and this is the uh, the fifth webinar in the uh, Early Careers Practitioners webinar series. Um, today, we have uh, Gareth Leonard with us from Regenesis, and he's going to be talking to us about uh, liquid activated carbon um, and its use as a remediation. So <clears throat> um, for those of you who haven't joined any of our webinars before, um, it's a series of webinars organized by the uh, Remediation Society. Uh, and it's designed um, uh, for early career practitioners. Uh, we've been going for uh, a couple of years now, um, and our focus is to help the um, early career practitioners within our industry. Uh, we've been doing that through various channels, uh, one of which is obviously the webinar series, uh, but we've also uh, had a, newsletter, a series of newsletters that have been posted uh, throughout last year. Um, and Really, we, uh, we, we need a little bit of uh, help from our members. So if you are an early career practitioner in the remediation industry and you'd like to get involved, then please feel free to uh, contact myself uh, or Sarah Poulter, who's, uh, who's usually the, uh, the host for these webinars, and we'd, uh, we'd be happy to get you on board or at least uh, take, a, take on board any, uh, any comments that you might have. But thanks for that, uh, Grant. Good, good thinking on your feet. Appreciate that. We just had a bit of a technical issue there starting. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to this REMSOC webinar number five. My name is Gareth Leonard. I'm the managing director of Regenesis in Europe. Today, I'm going to be talking about the use of liquid activated carbon for remediation. Um, I'm not only going to be talking about the, the technique itself and going through some case studies. I wanted to sort of take us on a journey of why we came up with the concept and how it was developed in the laboratory, which actually took about six years, and then um, move on to uh, how it was beta tested, and then finally onto commercial sites and, and, and where it's going from here, really, for the research that we're doing. So hopefully you'll find that interesting as we go along. So let's see if we can move on. Okay, so defining the problem. Why did we come up with the concept of liquid activated carbon? What is it we're trying to do? So here is a graph that you may or may not have seen. That's It's, it's a useful approximation for considering remedial approaches for your site. So on the x-axis, you can see the contaminant concentration going from very low dissolved phase concentrations on the left to free phase uh, NAPL on the right. The treatment efficiency is on the y-axis. So what you want to do is choose a remedial approach that is as high on the y-axis as possible so that you have the most efficient treatment of the contamination at that concentration level. So you, if you've got free product, uh, you're dealing with a fuel, something like that, you might use physical remediation, dig out the, the, the soils, skim off the, the free product. But as you will have seen with pump and treat systems, very quickly you're pumping a lot of water and not a lot of contamination so you need to move on to something more efficient for that lower concentration you move on to chemical oxidation and break down the contamination chemical oxidation works very well it is a contact sport however so the lower the concentration the less contact you're getting it starts to become inefficient for low dissolved phase contamination biological degradation it's generally the most efficient method. Uh, these microbes will break down the, the, the contaminants and get you down to very low levels. The problem is, is when you get down to, to, to very low concentrations, if you've got very uh, tight targets, you, you get a situ situation where the contamination is, is floating in the groundwater or moving through the groundwater, but the microbes generally are benthic. They're on the surface of the the uh, aquifer itself. So you're suffering from a lack of contact between the contamination and the microbes themselves. So we wanted to look at this part of the, the treatment sequence and to see if we can improve that. And what that would mean is we could get to lower targets and we could get there more rapidly. Biological degradation can, can generally get you to, to low targets, but because of this lack of contact at these very low concentrations, it means that projects can last quite a while. And this is just a little taster of, of where, what the sort of results you can see by using liquid activated carbon. Here we've got a, a mixed plume of chlorinated ethenes and ethanes. 
you apply the product, we are going to see enhanced reductive dechlorination. If you were just doing enhanced reductive dechlorination without the, the, the sorption side of the treatment, you would then see sequential degradation and production of daughter products over a number of months. With the liquid activated product, liquid activated carbon product, this is what we see. Now, enhanced reductive dechlorination is still going on, uh, but it's happening on the surface of the activated carbon itself. And I'll, I'll come back to this site and show you how, you how we can see this. So what is liquid activated carbon? What we've done is we've created um, a colloidal liquid. So a colloidal liquid is something that is um, suspended solids in, yeah, okay, suspended particles uh, in a liquid. So um, blood is a colloid, milk is a colloid, wine is a colloid, so a true liquid. And, and this liquid activated carbon is a true liquid as well. What we've done is we've milled activated carbon down to one to two micron in size. Now, in terms of giving you an idea of scale, granular activated carbon that you will have used for pump and treat systems for treatment of water, the, the particles there that you can see, they're, they're normally about a millimeter, about a thousand micron. Powdered activated carbon you might have used for uh, vapor treatment you're going to be somewhere around about 40 to 100 uh, micron. Here we're about one micron. So this is the same size as a, a red blood cell. It's the same size, crucially, of a microbe in the subsurface. So that's good. We've made this, this particle. The idea is that it's going to spread through the subsurface, coat the subsurface. But what would happen is if we just put this in water, they would stick back together again. They would clump back together again. So we've mixed it with a dispersive agent that stops these colloids, these particles sticking together, which means that you can flow it under low pressure into the subsurface. As it moves through the subsurface, because it's not clumping together, there's no clogging. As it hits the subsurface, as it bumps into the aquifer itself, it coats the subsurface, it sticks at that point, and, and you get a coating on the subsurface, and I'll show you some photographs of that. What it's doing then, as when you inject, is the first thing it does is adsorb the contamination. It, it adsorbs the contamination in the groundwater, and then as it sticks to the surface of the aquifer, it keeps that contamination with it. Um, I'll show you a little bit later as well. Once it's there, further contamination coming in, either through advection or back diffusion, is then captured by the, the activated carbon as well. So it concentrates the contamination on the surface of itself, on the surface of the, the biomatrix, as we call it at this point, the activated carbon. And that creates the, the, the perfect setting to grow microbes. And you can apply it with electron donor, electron acceptor. Uh, you can even seed it with, with microbes uh, if needed, or you can allow indigenous microbes to grow. And what you've done is you've concentrated the contamination in one area so that the microbes can grow and feed on it. And you get a much more efficient biological degradation of this contamination. So what that means is you get a rapid reduction of the contamination due to the sorption, and then you get sustained contaminant destruction through the biological degradation, which means you can achieve very low uh, targets. So how would you use it? The remedial approach, the concept behind it, would be this. This is the subsurface. This is a scanning electron microscope picture of some sand particles. That little triangular hole at the bottom there is about 20 micron uh, across. That would be a pore throat. And then at the top there, you've got something like a 50 by 100 uh, micron pore space. We inject the product into the subsurface. We're trying to put the product into the flux zones, into the areas through which the groundwater and the contamination is moving. We flow the, 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 the plume stop, the liquid activated carbon, into these zones, and it starts to stain the subsurface. It's like an ink. It's, it stains everything. All of our site gear is, is now black. Um, it, as, it, as it moves through the subsurface, it stains the subsurface. And here we've zoomed in onto the surface of one of those sand particles. And those are individual particles of liquid activated carbon of the plume stop. And that's about one to two micron you can see there. So what happens is we're coating the subsurface, but we're not reducing the permeability. We're creating uh, an underground uh, activated carbon filter. And what happens is the contamination adsorbs to that. It grows microbes on the surface of it. You get biological degradation of that contamination. 
If you're getting biological degradation of that contamination, it means you are regenerating the sorption site. You're cleaning the contamination off the activated carbon. So further influx from upgradient, if you've applied it as a barrier, or back diffusion from lower, permeable zone, lower permeability zones, adsorbs to the uh, liquid activated carbon again, you get biofilm growth, accelerated biological degradation. So the, the activated carbon filter that you've put in the subsurface regenerates its self-cleaning, and this keeps it going for decades. So how it would be applied on the site, we've got a, a industrial unit uh, on the right there. We've got the receptor in this case is a river or houses down gradient. You've got a plume um, coming towards the edge of the site. Now, the, the name that we have for the product is plume stop. Uh, and the idea is that you apply it within the plume. It, 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 it's not used in source areas. If you get an apple onto an activated carbon, that's the end of your activated carbon, it's coated. What we're trying to do is target the distal end of the plume. And some of these plumes can be very large indeed. So you're putting in a barrier in this particular case, it limits the expansion of the plume. It, it, it stops that contamination moving beyond the site boundary perhaps, and it can buy you time to, to then go in and remove the source. So you can put this at the edge of the site while the, the site's being demolished, et cetera. It can protect um, receptors on, on large scale plumes where you're doing monitored natural attenuation. You can engineer the shape of the plume to protect um, certain zones such as uh, housing, rivers, et cetera. So if we look in cross-section, what we've got in the subsurface is heterogeneity. You'll have low permeability zones, you'll have high permeability zones. And the contamination in the groundwater tends to flow through this mobile porosity, the permeable zones themselves. And here you can see it flowing from, from right to left. What we want to do with the plume stop is not inject it everywhere, but inject it within those flux zones, flux being the amount of contamination uh, and the, the rate at which it is flowing through the subsurface. So when doing a site investigation, once you've, you've worked out where the contamination is, you've delineated it, you've decided uh, what approach uh, you want to take, you need to go in and, and look very closely uh, at the grain size, at where those flow zones are within the subsurface. We then drive a direct push rod, or you might use a well or another technique into those zones and apply the product under low pressure. It spreads through, it spreads through the formation and captures the contamination there. I'll come back to a development on that on that graphic later on. So in the laboratory, there's a number of steps that we wanted to test um, while we're developing the product. As I say, this took about six years, so I'm not going to I'm going to go through it fairly quickly. The first one is distribution. Are we managing to get the distribution? On the left, we've got plume stop. And on the right, we've got powdered activated carbon. Now, powdered activated carbon might be expected to flow through this formation. It's, it's fairly small uh, in, in diameter. Here, we're just flowing ground, through flowing water and allowing it to percolate through gravity. But you'll see the powdered activated carbon, it doesn't progress because it clumps together. The plume stop, however, it, it moves through that formation and you can see the color change. It's staining the formation as it goes through. And we did a lot of tests on this. You can see this is about a five meter scale here. You can see the IBCs in the background um, for scale. Uh, where we're, we're just testing how far we can go. And then we're slicing into those columns to measure how much carbon was there. And, and then we can measure and equate uh, the, the coating. And we do get a one to two micron coating of the formation itself. So we're not affecting the permeability. So looking at that adsorption on this test here, we've got um, xylene. We've got a control there, which is the red. There's about 11 milligram per liter of xylene um, being flowed through a column. We apply the plume stop and immediately we get down to, to non-detect. Continue flowing 15 pore volumes through of fairly high concentration. And you see we get no breakthrough at all there. So we're getting the adsorption. We're taking the contamination out of the groundwater in this test. The next test then, are we getting biological degradation? Here we've got three tests. You can see the blue is the sterile control. And then we've got the red and the purple both are treated with plume stop. So 
here we're on to benzene, so we've moved away from xylene, we're on benzene. Again, fairly high concentrations. We're applying the plume stop, uh, the, the, the plume stop for the red and the purple um, at the start, and you see that reduction in both the red and the purple. You go down from about 35 down to about 18 milligram per liter. Now, the red one has plume stop in the sample, but it's been sterilized. There cannot be any microbial growth in there. So we don't see any further reduction in the level of contamination in the sample. The purple sample, you can see, continues down. So after that initial adsorption, we then get a further reduction in the contaminant levels, and that's because of the biological degradation that we're seeing once we concentrate the contamination onto the plume stop. Taking that further then, if we look at the bioregeneration, this sample here is, um, the, the, the analysis you're seeing here is a measurement of milligrams. Not milligrams per kilogram, not milligrams per liter, it's, it's a total system ex extraction uh, of milligrams. So it's the amount on the water, on the plume stop, on the soil that's in there as well. And what we're doing is going in uh, every 14 days, so every two weeks, spiking, these two um, samples with more PCE and, and then measuring the, the level of contamination as it goes along. So if you look at the sterile soil, the blue level, we, we spike that every two weeks, the amount of contamination in the soil and water goes up, which makes sense. If you look at the live soil with plume stop, so we've got plume stop in there, we've got microbes growing on the plume stop, we spike it, we put the contamination in, Next time we come around to look at it, that contamination's gone. And it's it's not absorbed or hidden anywhere. It's gone from the water, it's gone from the plume stop, it's gone from the soil, so it's been broken down. So we spike again, breaks down, spike again, breaks down. So you can see that there's this regeneration going on. We're breaking down the contamination to allow further sorption sites uh, to take out the contamination. Okay, so, that took about six years. I know I've gone through it in about five minutes, but we started to take the, the product to, to beta testing sites and trying it in the real world. So in the real world, identifying these flux zones is key. Um, it's, it's something that we, we notice much more than products we've had in the past, which are consumable donors, consumable electron acceptors, which um, once you've got them in the ground, they move, they, they, they diffuse so that you can put them near to where you want to be and they'll, they'll move into the treatment areas. Here we're constructing a subsurface activated carbon filter, so we need to get it in the right location. So when, when you're doing your site investigation, looking at those flux zones is key. And you can see on the sites that when we inject, you can see where that plume stop um, gets emplaced. So if you look on the left, this was a, b a beta site where you've got a clay, then you've got a gravelly layer, then a clay, and you can see that that gravel gets painted. We're painting it, it black, um, and, and you can measure it in various ways. So this is a dry cleaner site in the US that was one of the first beta sites. Small dry cleaner, they've been having a leak of PCE over the years. 10 meter per year groundwater flow, uh, very aerobic dune sand, so uh, not a hint of biological degradation at all on this site, just PCE moving across the site. Fairly low concentrations, 550 microgram per liter, and we apply the plume stop into this area. If you look at the red line, um, it goes straight down after 20 days and, and then stays flat. So that's taking the contamination out of the groundwater. Um, which then makes it slightly difficult to, to monitor what's going on with the, 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 the degradation of the product. One thing you can do is a microbial assay. Um, you can look for what microbes are growing um, on the surface of the plume stop itself, and that'll tell you what they're up to. So you can look for dehalocoides growth, so you, you, you know that uh, vinyl chloride's been broken down. You can do quantitative polymerase chain reaction testing to look at what enzymes are being used and they encode for different contaminants. So we only had PCE here at the start, but you can see that the microbial growth and the PCR testing shows that daughter products are, are being produced and broken down, but they're happening on the surface of the, the activated carbon itself. So you're keeping the risk from this contamination while you're remediating it to a minimum. 
So commercial sites, after we did um, beta testing, we moved into real world sites. Um, and generally what we'll do on a site is we'll do a pilot study, dial into the site, and then we'll move into full scale treatment. Um, we've had the product on the market for uh, a little over three years now, I think, in um, in the US, maybe getting on for four, uh, and a little bit later in, in Europe. So this is the graph I showed you right at the start, and why, why I want to come back to this, this was a commercial site. And you can see that um, since the first graph, the x-axis has extended to 550 days. I think we've gone a little bit beyond that in terms of validation now. So we put the plume stop in, if you look at this and think about regeneration, if we were just causing sorption and not biological degradation, at some point that plume stop would become saturated um, and you would see that the uh, PCE would move through. Um, just like you, when, when calculating uh, the use of gas vapor membranes, when they become saturated, you'll start to see breakthrough. Uh, here we have the application and the reduction now, at some point along here, based on the flux, so the amount of contamination and the groundwater flow coming into the amount of carbon that we've put in, you could project that you would have a breakthrough at this point. And we don't see anything and it keeps going and it keeps going and it keeps going. So what, what is happening is we're getting that biological degradation. That PCE is no longer there, it's being broken down and further PCE coming in is being broken down. And it's now greater than two years. Okay, so, I, We've got lots of case studies. We, we, I, I can show you lots of different sites. When it came to May 2016 uh, in the US, we'd had the product for about two years at that point um, on the market, plus we had some beta sites. We decided that we needed to collate a lot of these sites together and um, see if what we were seeing in the real world matched the, the, the great results that we were seeing in the laboratory. You see that it was behaving um, the way we hoped it was behaving. At this point, I think we had about 80 sites and we managed to get data back from our clients for um, 50 of them. No, I'm lying. We had 50 sites and we got data back on 24 of them. Um, and we pooled all that data together. And what we wanted to do was look at two things. We wanted to look at the reductions that we got at the start um, to see that that adsorption it was happening. And, and then we wanted to see whether the long-term treatment stayed low, whether we got a rebound, were we getting that biological degradation? Were we um, dealing with the contamination that was, was coming into barriers? or uh, within the, 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 the sites that we treated. So this is the first graph I'm gonna show you. It's not that easy to read. So basically, if you look at the x-axis, this is the amount of reduction we got uh, in a well. And then on the y-axis, this is the, the frequency, essentially the percentage of wells that responded in that way. So on the right there, the 96 to 100%, these are wells that got a 96 to 100 percent reduction so from the starting concentration they were reduced by between 96 and 100 percent and then you see other wells responding slightly less so 65 percent of all the wells we looked at achieved a greater than 95 percent reduction within 90 days and that's typically to the detection limits 70 percent achieved 90 percent reduction 90 percent received an 80 percent reduction and then we had a few problem sites where 10% got less than 65%. And where that happened is on, on pilot sites and where we've gone in and, and, and the early things that happened was we discovered that there was higher concentrations than expected, typically NAPL on a TPH site, or the flux zones weren't as understood uh, as we realized. And they, this is something that, as we've gone on with it, we, we, we know that this is something that, that's key to understanding and getting the most accurate uh, design and, and the best treatment. But overall, we're seeing a really good reduction. So then we go on to what happens on a, a longer period. Sorry, I didn't say that. So this was the first one to three monitoring rounds. So this is the first three months or so of treatment. The longer term performance, we're now looking at the wells over an average of 200 days. The, the longest one at this point was 738 days. Now, the x-axis here 
is the percentage increase post the initial capture. So if you had 100% here, what would happen is you would have had a 100% reduction uh, when you captured it, and then you have 100% bounce back to where you started. So what we want to see is lots of red on the left-hand side of the graph, okay? And that's what we tend to see. So we've got 70% show no change or, or drop further. So what that means is we get a good um, dramatic reduction at the start, and, and then 70% of those are, are showing no change or it's continuing to go down. 85% remain within 10%. So it's, it's kind of bobbling around at the point of that initial uh, reduction, so that's good. And then we got a few that didn't perform as well, and and that's for the reasons that I explained that the, it it was a it's a learning process of finding out where those flux zones are, ensuring that the concentrations that you've sampled are are, are true uh, within the flux zone, or maybe you've got a long screen and that's diluting what what you think is actually in the site. But overall, we're seeing a very good reduction um, at the start, and then those levels are staying low, as we hoped. So moving to Europe, um, this is um, the Volvo factory in Ghent. Um, in Belgium, you have to, if you own a factory, you have to test the groundwater under your factory and you have to do something about it if you find that it's contaminated. Um, on this site, they've got a, a BTEX plume. It's not actually causing an issue, but they want to deal with it before it does. Um, here they've got very fine running sands, very, very fine running sands. And the site had a lot of footing services and the groundwater is going about 10, 20 meters per year, fairly aerobic conditions. What we did here is um, complete a pilot study. You can see uh, two rows of injections in a corridor there. Groundwater is going from right to left. Um, we intercept, degrade the contamination and then measure that down gradient. So we turned up for, di for, for the site. Um, tried direct push, didn't work at all. And what, what was happening is we, we drove the direct push rods down into the ground. For those of you who have not used direct push, it's a hollow stem rod. Um, you use a window sampling uh, rig essentially or something with a, a bit more grunt. Um, you pump down inside the, the rod. It's got ports at the bottom of the rod that, that um, send the liquid out horizontally and you can in inject aliquots of material, um, measured amounts um, vertically as you move up um, or down through the formation. The problem we were having is because it was fine running sands, we just couldn't get any friction against the edges of the rod. So the product was coming straight back to the surface. So we abandoned that route. We drilled wells um, into the subsurface. And then what we used is um, packers. This is a double packer and stringer assembly. Um, so what you have is the, the, the stringer is a, just a pipe that goes down and has holes in it. And then you have a packer, which is an inflatable donut packer um, that, that locks the rod inside the well. So when you inject in the well, it doesn't all come to the surface and you can lock it off at different positions within the well to inject at, at that location. And then this is the injection. You've got um, some product in the middle there. It's being moved to a mixing tank within the van where it's diluted and mixed. It goes to a um, high flow, low pressure pump, which you can just see by the wheel there. And then that went into the factory uh, and injected into the well. And we, we cleaned up after every day. And these are the results. So, so fairly cheeky con concentrations of BTEX, about um, 18,000 microgram per liter. Upon injection, we see a 95% reduction after about two to three months. After five months, we're at non-detect. Um, and that site is now going to um, full-scale remediation uh, within a couple of months from now. So we've done, oh, I think we've done about 140 sites worldwide now. It might be a, a little bit higher than that, um, but we aren't, Resting on our laurels, there's a lot to learn uh, about this treatment approach. And um, so one of the things we're, we're looking at, uh, looking into is the treatment of back diffusion. Now, you, you'll have heard of the term rebound. So rebound is when your um, validation results have gone down nicely and they're either heading towards target or flatlining and, and suddenly they bounce back up again. And rebound, 
in a source area is generally attributable to desorption. You've got some mass in there that's dissolving into the, the groundwater and you need to remove that. Here we're in a plume. So there's not a lot of sorbed phase contamination. So if you're seeing rebound, say you've done pump and treat, say you've done some biological degradation and, and it's, it's ran out, you might see some rebound. It could be coming from advection up gradient, but often the issue that you have in plumes is back diffusion. So you've seen a picture there where we were flowing where contamination was moving through these flux zones. Well, the contamination doesn't just exist within the flux zones. So it, it moves through these flux zones, it flows through these high permeability zones. But what it creates is a concentration gradient between the mobile porosity and the immobile porosity. If you've got a concentration gradient, you'll get diffusion and that contamination diffuses into these low permeability zones. If you then clean out the mobile porosity, what happens is you reverse the concentration gradient. It won't be as steep, but it will be reversed. So what you then have is back diffusion. So the movement of contamination from a low permeability zone to a high permeability zone. And if you're monitoring, your well will be taking water from those high permeability zones, and that's when you'll start to see rebound through to through back diffusion. So this is a test that we were doing with um, Tom Sale at Colorado State University. Um, what we've got here is um, a series of low permeability and high permeability zones, and we're using that to emulate the subsurface. So if we, we emulate the subsurface, we'll turn it on its side, grow some grass on the top, put some sky on top, you can now see that that's an aquifer, okay? Okay, use a bit of imagination, it's the best I can do with PowerPoint. So the groundwater is flowing from left to right through this solar tank, and it's going through these sandy layers, okay? And what we've done is we've, um, We've got uh, chlorinated solvents in this, it's TCE, in this uh, water, and it's we flow it um, for a number of days through these high permeability zones. And what it's doing is it's diffusing into these silty zones. So it's not a clay, but it's, it's a fairly tight silt that we've put in there. Um, so this silt is taking on, taking on uh, contamination. It's not a flow of water carrying contamination into these silts. It's a flow of contamination through water. Okay. You don't need permeability. You just need porosity. It's diffusion. So then we we um, pump plume stop into the subsurface. And, and as you saw, we're aiming for these flux zones. We're aiming for these high permeability zones. So this yellow dotted line is us drilling a well, and then we inject into these high permeability zones. And you can see there that the, the, the plume stops going from left to right. And some really interesting little patterns there on the right as it, as it fingers through the formation as we, as we flow it into the subsurface. Because it's a, 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 a like an ink, um, very low viscosity, it just kind of flows through the subsurface, it, it, it paints everything, it coats everything. Um, and you can see after a while, those permeable zones are completely coated with the plume stop. So what's happening in there is you get an adsorption of the contamination, you're getting biological degradation, and, and it's getting rid of the contamination within those permeable zones. We continue to flow clean water through those zones but, and measure how much contamination we're seeing um, at the outlet. And we've got another tank here without the plume stop, so we can we can see how much back diffusion we're getting from those silty zones um, where there's no plume stop and then where there is plume stop. There's an interesting thing that happened here though, is if you notice that plume stop seems to be in the silt. And although when we were looking at this, it looked like potentially it's just an artifact of it moving across the surface of that perspex. When we cut into them, you do find that because plume stop's so fine, it's it's actually permeating the silt itself. And that's interesting because a lot of the contamination that you get that, that forces in, in these silts that, that creates back diffusion is necessarily in the edges of this silt. You know, it's nearer the source of the contamination when it when forward diffusion was contaminating the silts. So we're getting plume stop into where the repository of contamination is in, the, in these low permeability zones. And if we look, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself, but if we look 
at the biological growth. Uh, I'll, I'll show you in a moment. Here we, we're looking at the effluent data. The, the green is the salad tank that we used that didn't have any plume stop in. And so you can see TCE levels are quite high at the start. Now that's after pumping in clean water. So this TCE is coming not from us, but from these silty layers. You see it goes down over time because there's only a certain amount of TCE we could force into that silt over time. And you will see that um, in m and projects, but generally over months or years. But if you look at the plume stop treated line, whoops, the plume stop treated line, you're not seeing any back diffusion at all. And that's because we're catching the contamination that's back diffusion from the, the silt into the sandy layers, catching that and degrading it. Interestingly though, interestingly though, if you cut into the low permeability zone and, and measure the microbes that are being grown, where you've got plume stop, you're seeing microbes growing within the silt itself. So we are driving enhanced reductive dechlorination within the residual source in those silts as well. So there's a two pronged approach to dealing with the back diffusion. We're getting into the silt, which I have to admit we didn't think we could do. And we are dealing with the contamination that's back diffusing out and capturing that. So new horizons. We're obviously moving forward using this, this product for uh, organic contaminants. That's what we planned it for, chlorinated solvents, um, petroleum hydrocarbons, uh, these, these large problematic plumes that you get, particularly with chlorinated solvents, they can be huge, huge plumes in, in, in different parts of the world. Then came along emerging contaminants, particularly um, PFAS, um, per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. And these tend to come from uh, from firefighting foams. They can come from uh, coatings on on furniture. They come from coatings on on uh, your frying pan. They come from on clothing. They're kind of everywhere. And it turns out they are somewhat problematic. They're still working on how much of a risk they are to humans, but they appear to bioaccumulate. So if they're bioaccumulating, it's probably not a good thing to have them knocking around. And, and it turns out that there are plumes of these PFAS products all over. And, and there's no consensus yet in terms of target levels, but areas like Australia that are, that are leading the charge on this, um, Scandinavia are starting to come down to targets of around about 45, 60 nanograms per liter. So pretty low concentrations. A lot of these sites, are, they're just doing pump and treat. So you might have a fire training area at an airport. At the edge of that site, you've got a pump and treat system that's just pulling out the water. You're taking away the activated carbon that they're using to capture that PFAS. And then you're trying to put that in a landfill and landfills often aren't that keen on it anyway. So it's a, it's a large ongoing cost. So we thought, well, can we do anything with PFAS? We can't biologically degrade the contamination, but we can adsorb it. And if we can adsorb it, we can reduce the risk that this contamination is posing. So it's risk-based remediation. Um, and potentially we can uh, retard the movement of this PFAS from, from a source area beyond the boundary of the site, for instance, and we can do that potentially for decades. And in that time, if, 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 well, in that time, what can happen again, if we start to see breakthrough in a few decades, you can apply more plume stop. So you can stop it going again, or it buys you time to do some sort of source treatment in, in that area and um, capping, or, you know, if it's several decades, maybe a new technology will come along that can degrade the, the PFAS. So we started trying out in laboratories, but I, I just want to show you this site. It's a, the, the first ever in situ remediation of PFAS um, in the world that I know of, I'd like to say. And it was aimed at PFOS and PFOA. And it was a site that made furniture, but they had a fire training area on the same site. Initially, the idea was to go to the site and deal with the uh, petroleum hydrocarbon plume that they had on the site that we also used the plume stop for. 
but then it was noticed that there was PFAS contamination on the site as well. So an application was made there, and that's where the, PF the plume stop was applied. Um, at the bottom there is where it was targeting the, the, the PFAS. Those are the PFOS and P4 concentrations. And you can see after three months, we were at non-detect. Um, 15 months, we were still at non-detect. And I think we've got another round coming up, but it's staying at non-detect, basically. Um, so we are capturing and absorbing that contamination. Now, PFOS and P4 are some of the longer chain PFAS compounds. So they are easier to absorb. And there is con the, the question then is, what about these shorter chain uh, PFAS? Um, you, you can go to the um, perfluorobutyl uh, butanoic acids um, and, and they are very short chain, they sorb less, so potentially they will just move through the treatment that we have. So this is from a site in uh, Italy where we're doing some testing at the moment. And what we did is we did some batch testing. We um, put the plume stop into some uh, groundwater from the site and, and looked at the reductions that we got. And we got good reductions in everything and we got a, a pretty good reduction in the short chain material, but obviously not as good as, as everything else. So let me put that on a different graph. So there you go, we've got 99.8% we got sorption overall. Let me break that down for you. So the first treatment we put in 2000 ppm plume stop um, and, and got the results from it. The second treatment, now, let me let me get this graph up and it'll make more sense. Okay, so here it is. Here's the control and here's the, the all the different PFAS that are, are within the sample itself. We then apply 2000 uh, milligram per liter of plume stop and then we get this reduction. So where you see the red line, that's the residual contamination. Where you don't see any red line, all those contaminants have been completely removed from the water, okay? So that's what we're left with. And you can see that it's some of the shorter chain contaminants, particularly the perfluorobutanoic acid that, that remains high. So overall, we get a 98.5% reduction, but we're only looking at sort of an 80% reduction, I think a 70% reduction actually, sorry, in, in the PFBA. So the thing we did then was take that sample that had already been treated and retest it as if emulating two barriers. So the first barrier took out all the long chain PFAS and then those shorter chain um, precursors moved through and we, we had them enter a second barrier of the same dose. So now if you look, if you can't see anything, that contamination has been removed. If you see the green, that's what's left over. And here you see we've removed everything except the PFBA and we're down to an 86% reduction in the PFBA. So we can remove these shorter chain contaminants. They are more challenging. And so it might need um, several barriers. It might need a longer barrier so that you get greater residence time. But it's showing um, great results. Um, we're seeing a lot of interest in this uh, across uh, the globe. Uh, and it's just a, a, an interesting new direction. And then that's me. So I'll just hand over to um, Grant now to, to finish up. Um, like I say, if you think of anything uh, you need to ask, it's no problem, just email and, and, and we'll get back to you on this. Um, thanks for your time, everyone. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks a lot there, Gareth. That was, uh, that was fantastic and uh, really informative. And uh, yeah, well, six years in the making, that's dedication to the cause. Um, yes, so if anybody does have any questions, uh, feel free to contact Gareth or myself and we'll, uh, we'll forward them on and, uh, and get back to you. Um, and as well as that, we'd, uh, we'd really appreciate any, any feedback or comments that you might have on the webinar and, and this webinar in particular or the entire webinar series that we've done so far um, obviously your, you know your feedback and your information helps us to uh, to decide how to uh, go forward with future webinars and other events that we might be hosting so uh, thanks again to Gareth for uh, taking some time today to uh, to, to present the webinar and uh, we'll hope to hear from you again soon thank you very much <laughs>